Hey everyone, PA here, Pastor Adam Burden. Thanks so much for tuning in to our Every Nation channel. And uh, I got news for you today. God has got a word for you. God's got a word for you uh, today. And so uh, we are closing out our series we've called the ABCs of Faith. And uh, we've just been going through the letters of the alphabet. And today we're on the letter Z. And Z stands for zeal. Zeal. And if I could just uh, simply... Uh, kind of define zeal, I would say it's this, it's passion in action, passion uh, in action. And so before we get into our text today, we're going to be in the, the book of Revelation, so buckle up. Uh, but before we get there, uh, I need to tell you the story, uh, an origin story. I love origin stories, and uh, I want to talk to you about the teddy bear today. Now, if, I've, uh, if I was a good pastor, I'd have a teddy bear prop here today, but I couldn't get my hands on a teddy bear, and so uh, so just work with me here, okay? But the, but the teddy bear, how it came to be, it was actually um, our 26th president was a uh, teddy Roosevelt and Roosevelt was an avid hunter, big game hunter. And so he was invited down to a lodge down in Mississippi to hunt bear. And so it was there at the lodge, like every guy in the camp uh, got a bear except for the president. And so, uh, so but not, not to be uh, deterred here, his, uh, one of his assistants went out the next morning. I don't know how they did this. They trapped a black bear uh, and tied it to a post. And then they, they uh, got the president up and they said, here, Teddy, you can shoot this bear. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to kill the poor bear. It's tied to a, a post, you know. And so, uh, so he didn't kill the bear. But get this, word got back to Washington, D.C. In the Washington Post, uh, they made this uh, cartoon caricature. Uh, should be coming up on your screen. And it was just how, how Teddy wouldn't kill the bear. And so somebody in Brooklyn, after seeing this cartoon, they decided they were going to make a stuffed animal called, wait for it, the teddy bear, right? And that's, that's how the, the teddy bear came to be. And so, uh, uh, but get this, uh, Roosevelt, uh, he was a man who understood zeal. And in fact, as a little boy, he was terrified to go uh, into the church. And his mom, Mitty, was like, son, why are you so afraid to go to the church? And he said this, zeal lives there. There's zeal in that house. And then the mom's like, uh, Mitty goes, uh, what do you think zeal is? And he's like, I don't know. It's like an alligator or a dragon or something. <laughs> and so uh, uh, he goes, she goes, where did you get that? And then the pastor uh, read a passage of scripture. It was actually from John 2. And it reads like this. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Right? And so young Roosevelt, he heard those words and he thought, man, zeal must be a monster or, or something like that. But, but like I said, Teddy Roosevelt, he understood zeal, this passion in action. In fact, he was, he was campaigning for the presidency, and as he was giving a speech, a would-be assassin took a 32 caliber bullet and put it into his chest. And so Roosevelt was shot, but he didn't stop his speech. In fact, he just simply said, I'm going to have to uh, speed my speech up because there's a bullet lodged in my chest. And he went on to speak for 53 minutes. 53 minutes, he was standing in a pool of his own blood. And so I want to tell you something, that is zeal, baby. That's zeal in action right there. And so, um, but Roosevelt is known for a speech. And this will be kind of our launching pad into our text today. It's called The Man in the Arena. The Man in the Arena. And I, I'd like to read it for you. It should be coming up on the screen. And it says this, it says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. 
And so, um, uh, like, like, I don't know, I hope you feel that with me here today. Like, like Roosevelt is saying, man, those people whose life is filled with, with meaning and purpose are the people that are actually in the arena. And so, um, uh, I've, I've been the, the chaplain for the New York Jets since about 2008. And I can remember just, uh, it's only been the last few years that I've been traveling with the team. And I remember my first uh, road trip that I was, I was traveling with, with the team. And uh, we were playing the, the Cleveland uh, Browns. And, and and in it, we were we were down in the fourth quarter, and I, I, like the statistics said, we had like a three percent chance of pulling out and winning the game. And get this, we won. And so, man, the, everybody was going crazy. Man, the, the GM Joe Douglas, he hugged me. He doesn't even know who I am. And <laughs> but I remember we we're on the team bus on the way out, and the Cleveland fans they were kind of lining the streets of Cleveland as we were leaving in the team bus, and everyone was was giving the finger <laughs> to the team. You're number one, right? But you know what was so crazy? In that moment, I was so honored to be dishonored by those people, right? I felt like in a small way, I was part of the team. I was in the arena. In fact, uh, uh, having played in the NHL for 14 years, you know, I'll, I'll turn the NHL network on and, and periodically, man, I'll, I'll come up uh, in one of the things like, but, but I'm always either getting beat up or scored on, <laughs> right? But here's what's crazy, even in defeat, there's something special about seeing yourself in that. It's because, hey, I was in the arena. And that's what Jesus, like I hope today that you feel the call of God calling you in to the arena, God's purpose for your life. Uh, he's gonna call out a church, the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter three. Um, he's calling them uh, out of mediocrity and in to the arena. Revelation three, I'm gonna read verses 14 to 21 says this, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot or you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that uh, you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous, and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And, and so um, uh, Jesus is calling the church of Laodicea out of lukewarmness and calling them uh, into the arena, God's purpose and mission uh, for your life. And so here's a, a, our points. I'm a pastor. I have to have three points. And point number one is this. Uh, lukewarm people are spit out of the mouth of God. Lukewarm people are spit out of the mouth of God. And so uh, my family has a, like, like a man, like a $10 a day Starbucks habit, okay? Uh, don't judge us. But, you know, it's amazing when you go to Starbucks, um, they're going to ask you if you want your coffee hot or cold. Uh, lukewarm is just not an option, all right? Because nobody likes lukewarm coffee. And you know what? The Lord doesn't like lukewarm things either, okay? He says, man, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out uh, of, of, of my mouth. And so, um, so there was a uh, pastor, uh, Tim Delina, he pastors Times Square Church uh, in Manhattan, and he was sharing the story of a missionary trip he went to Rwanda, and many of you are familiar with the, the genocide that took place in Rwanda. And As he was in this worship service, he says uh, he, he met a man that he'd never seen worship like this. And um, during this worship service, there's no lights or sound system or anything, but people are passionately worship, worshiping, and one man in particular, as tears streamed down his face, and then he would clap and get this, it, it, he wouldn't make any sound when he clapped. And here's the reason why, that both his hands had been chopped off by Hutu militia. When he clapped, all he had was nubs, but he was a passionate worshiper uh, of God. In fact, Pastor Tim Delina, he was like, hey man, lay hands on me, because I want the zeal, the fire that's on you to come uh, upon me. And so, um, the, do you know that actually the, the word enthusiasm it's literally the word entheos, 
in God. That there's this enthusiasm when we're in God that should mark our life as followers of Christ. And so um, we should never be accused of being lukewarm, just kind of wah, wah, wah. But what? As we are in God, man, something should fill us. And I'm, I'm not advocating kind of emotionalism, but honestly, if we're aware of, man, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, like eternity uh, and everlasting life belongs to us. Like the scripture says that you and I were more than conquerors, that God is for us who can be against us like that should fire you up at least a little bit and so uh, and I want to tell you this people aren't uh, moved by lukewarm people they're just not and so if you're a lukewarm follower of Christ, can I just plead with you today? Man, you are choosing to live the, the worst of, of both worlds. Like you have too much God inside of you to enjoy your sin, uh, but too much of the world inside of you to give glory to God in the earth. It's the worst of both worlds. And so, man, people like to be around passionate people. Uh, one of those people is uh, John Wesley. He was actually the, the founder of the Methodist movement. He, he preached to thousands and thousands of people uh, on horseback and uh, actually about 42,000 sermons he's preached. But, but here's, I want you to read a quote or read a quote about him. Uh, Wesley was asked, what is your secret? Why do so many people come to hear you preach? And Wesley answered, I get alone with God in prayer. He sets me on fire and the people come to watch me burn. Man, it's like man, people want to see passionate people. Um, there's another great, um, uh, guy, uh, George Whitfield. Uh, he too was an open air preacher. This was back uh, in the day when, when pastors would just kind of read their transcripts like this, like super boring. And this guy Whitfield, he was animated and anointed. In fact, uh, it was said that, that people would make sure they wouldn't bring money uh, to his sermons because when he would take up an offering, you couldn't refuse. <laughs> and so uh, one of the guys who'd love to hear him was Benjamin Franklin. Here's what's crazy. Benjamin Franklin, uh, he wasn't actually a Christian. He was, he was a deist, uh, okay? And, and then Franklin was asked, why do you listen to Whitfield? You don't believe what he believes. And Franklin's response was this, yeah, I don't believe what he believes, but he believes it, <laughs> right? There's something about passion. When, when man, it's, it's um, zeal is passion in action. Um, there's another guy you may have heard of, uh, Tim Tebow. And I remember when Tim Tebow was uh, traded here to the New York Jets, and I was so curious to see what makes this young man tick. And so here's what I would say about Tebow. Like, he couldn't make a pass, uh, but he sure made a difference, right? I mean, this guy, um, he uh, was so full of God on the inside of him that, that it just spilled out everywhere he went and everything he did, right? There was a zeal that marked his life. It, it's what? It's passion and action. Um, and so, so uh, I heard something uh, this past week that really provoked me and challenged me. So there's a, there's a pastor, uh, Francis Chan. He, he at one point had a, a, a large church out in California, and he said a very provocative statement. He said, if Jesus planted a church next to his, his church would be bigger than Jesus' church. And I thought, whoa, what are you talking about, bro? And he says, yeah. He says, uh, because my church uh, and, and most churches in our nation, uh, they don't challenge people or ask much of people. The bar is very, very low. Jesus, on the other hand, when he says to come to him, man, the, the bar is extremely high. In fact, I'll read it to you. Matthew 16, verses 24 to 25. Jesus says this, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake uh, will find it man did you get that like so many of us today man church is just kind of this add-on thing Christianity is kind of this add-on thing if there's time you know and it just kind of runs in with my kids soccer and uh, man music class right but but man it's called to be so much more like our walk with Jesus he says to man deny himself and then take up our cross daily. It, it's the, it needs to be the central part uh, of our life. And for my moms and dads out there listening to this, listen to me, you need to live zealous for God. Uh, like half-hearted following Jesus 
will lead to full-blown indifference in your kid's life, right? You've got to passionately follow Jesus, if not for your sake, for the sake uh, of your kids. And so uh, uh, zeal for God, uh, it also, it refuses to let us play it safe, to live the safe, little, uh, unimpactful life. But man, zeal, it's going to cause us, man, to step out in faith. And so, uh, man, I, I, I was reading this story about a missionary couple that they were, they went to a closed nation, right? Christianity was outlawed and, and they were smuggling in Bibles. And so it was kind of like a scary thing. And, and as they were, they were driving, they needed to get gas for their car and they pull over and the guy gets out and he's, he's gassing up his car. And as he's standing there gassing the car, he notices that there's a man fixated on him, staring at him, peering at him. And so it made this, this missionary like real nervous, like, oh, are they onto us that, that we're Christians illegally smuggling Bibles? So he finishes up, he gets in the car, his wife gets in the car and they drive off. And as they're driving away, um, the husband confesses to the wife. He's like, you know what, sweetheart? He goes, you know that man that was, that was staring at us? Man, I, I think I felt the Lord wanted me to go talk to him. But I was like, man, I, I don't want to blow our cover. I need to get out of here. And the, the wife looked at the husband and she said this, I would rather be married to a martyr than a coward. <laughs> that guy woo, turns the car around. He gets over and come to find out that man that was staring at him, uh, he had received a vision from God. And God told him, you're to go to this gas station and you're to wait. Uh, for a messenger. That guy waited there for two days. And then this pastor had the fearlessness, the courage to share the gospel. And that man became born again, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so zeal for God is going to call you in to the arena. Uh, here's point number two is this. Uh, zeal is kindled by opening the door. Zeal is kindled by opening the door. We read it, uh, Revelation 3 and verse 20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And so this is so fascinating. We usually uh, use this scripture when we're talking to, to unbelievers, right? That Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart, right? Thing, which, which is, is good and true. But notice the context is he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers and that Jesus is knocking on, knocking on our heart, uh, that, that he wants to come in and have a uh, break bread with us. That's the idea of, of a relationship, a uh, fellowship. Jesus wants a relationship with you and the me. And so how do we do it? We need to open the door of our heart. And so, uh, um, how, how do we do that? Um, I, I would say this, do you know, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 27, it says this, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't let him get a foot uh, into the door of your life, man, that once he gets that opening, man, you're in trouble. And, and I don't know about you, but uh, I find that, that living in a Genesis 3, a sin-filled world, man, the door of my life is open to Satan, uh, like almost automatically. In fact, there's so many things opening the door of my heart towards the things of the devil. It, it's alarming. And I hope you feel that alarm here today. Like, like I'll just use me. So uh, I, I found this in my own life that, that I can't watch the news. Like, uh, like I try to stay informed, but I avoid the news, whether it's CNN or Fox. When I turn these things on, it's, it's opening the door to the devil for me because it tries to pit me against other people groups and, and things. And I, I got to understand my battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and not people. OK, uh, here's another one that that opens the door of my heart to the devil is uh, sometimes if I, if I watch too much TV or, or I listen to too much secular music. And so listen, I'm not the, oh, you, you know, just listen to only Christian music and Christian, like, hey, knock yourself out. I think Jesus can speak to me uh, in any secular song, okay? But let me tell you this, I found in my own life that if I listen to too much secular music, my, my mouth gets lazy. And man, there's, there's words that'll come out of my mouth that I don't think Jesus would be too pleased about. And as well, sometimes if I watch too much TV, you know what happens? I start laughing at things that Jesus died on the cross for, right? And so, so these are some ways that my heart gets open. Here'll be another one, social media. And I know it feels like every week I'm banging on social media, but man, for me, it opens the door. 
And so as a pastor of the church, I'm, I know I was, I was trying to get on Instagram and do some stuff that, that maybe would kind of like get the word out there more about our church. And here's what I found what happened is I would always check to see how many people were looking at my Instagram post. And you know what? I started to like it. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is getting way too big of a hold on my heart where people that I don't even know who they are somehow now are influencing uh, my life and controlling like, man, am I happy or am I sad today according to what they said? See, it's insane and it's an open door to the enemy for me in my life. And so, uh, listen, do you wanna shut the door on the devil? Open the door to Jesus. You want to slam the door shut on Satan, man, you need to open the door uh, to Jesus. And so um, here's a, like, like a few ways that, that, that uh, you can open the door of your heart and invite Jesus in to have a meal with you. Uh, here's a, a, like for me, I got to win the morning. I got to win the morning. And the way I win the morning is by getting in the prayer, into prayer and the word. And for the record, every sermon I preach uh, each and every week, it's basically the same thing. Uh, read your Bible and pray, right? I just add different stories every week. And so this, you want to win your morning. And the way you do that is by getting in the word and prayer. And so, man, the, the word of God, I, I'll illustrate this way. So I don't know what your favorite cereal is, man. I, I know there's some nostalgic cereals, man. Captain Crutch, Sugar Smacks, Fruit Loops, man. All these sugar uh, cereals from back in the day. But, but listen, it wasn't actually about the cereal. It used to be about the prize that was inside, right? And I, I remember Captain Crunch, that uh, it had a glow-in-the-dark compass. I'm like, thank you, Captain. Go to the store, whim, get that. My mom buys it for me. And, you know, you stick your nasty kid hand in the bottom of the cereal, dig it around with your dirty hands. And I pulled out the glow-in-the-dark compass. And I remember going into the closet and shutting the door and in the dark and open it up, nothing. I felt like the captain lied to me, man. Come to find out, I didn't read the directions. And the directions said that, that you have to hold it, what? Under the light for about an hour. And do you know what happens? Like, like uh, I, I went into the closet then after doing that and phew, it lit up the room. And in the same way, man, as you sit under the word of God, you sit under that, man, the, if the word says of itself that the Bible, it's living, it's active, it's doing something on the inside of you, that when we open it up, man, it's changing us uh, uh, from the inside out. And then the second part is prayer, is just talking to God. And, and, and prayer is so important. And let me share with you, like, uh, I feel like this is a good picture of what happens when we take time to pray. Is um, so. This is uh, back before World War One. They were trying to see if they could they fly a plane around the world, and and so uh, uh, somebody began from California, and they made it to the East Coast, and they were gassing up their plane uh, to make the the trip uh, over the ocean uh, in this field, and so they they're gassing up the plane. Uh, they get up, and so as they're flying uh, over the ocean, uh, come to find out, uh, the, the pilot found out that a rat had uh, gotten into his airplane and was gnawing at the steering cable. And he's like, oh my gosh, I, I can't go back. It's too far away. And, and I, it's another two hours before I land. What am I going to do? And so he, he figured out what he was going to do. Uh, he, he actually ascended another 2,000 feet into the air. And as he ascended, what the atmosphere changed. In fact, uh, at that altitude, what happens? Rats can't survive. And so the, the thing suffocated. And after it died, then he brought it back down to altitude. And do you know what? That's what happens to you and I. That when we go to the Lord in prayer, man, it's like we're ascending. We're going to altitude and there's the, the rats in our heart and in our life, they begin to slowly die out, right? It's called our flesh. And as we pray, the promises that the Holy Spirit is actually circumcising our flesh, cutting away the ugly parts of it. And it's what takes, uh, takes place with prayer. And so I want to tell you this, man, it's going to cost you something uh, to follow Jesus. Like it's going to cost you some of your time, but to, to not uh, uh, have it cost you something is to cost you everything, right? You've got to win the morning. And here's the second thing uh, that you got to do if you want to open the door to Jesus. Uh, and, and listen, you need to belong to a church. 
And I, I didn't say uh, go to church. I mean, you need to belong to a group uh, of people. Um, and so I, I know for me, I, I, listen, I'm the pastor, but I'm still, I, I'm also a participant of Every Nation New Jersey and our worship leader, Kim Frias. I mean, there was, a, I remember one particular morning where I just felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders and no matter what I did, man, I couldn't get it off of me. And then as a time in worship, as Kim began to lead us, in song, and she was, she was talking, she, we were singing about how God is the God who moves mountains. And as I, with each lyric that I started to sing, it was like weight was being lifted over and over and over again until, man, I, the weight of the world was lifted and I could raise my hands uh, in praise. Uh, I'll give you another one, like, like belonging to the church is, is I praying together with our church family. We do a uh, first Friday prayer, the first fri uh, Friday of every month, we get together and we pray and it's, uh, inevitably, uh, someone starts praying for me uh, as their pastor. And as they're praying, oh, and these beautiful prayers, I I'm kind of embarrassed by it, uh, but in the same way, it also just so fills me with encouragement uh, in life, right? It's, it's what happens, man, when you open the door by belonging to a local church. It it's God's uh, idea for you. And so I want to tell you this, uh, fear is free, faith takes work. Fear is free. Man, it's just, uh, it's going to be all around you. But if you want to walk in faith, it's going to take work. The word and prayer and belonging to your local church. And so, uh, and here's point number three is this. Uh, notice in our text that we move from a bite to a fight. <laughs> we move from a bite to a fight. Jesus says, I'm going to come and break bread with you and eat. And then he goes on and he starts talking about conquering. Uh, let me read it to you in, in Revelation 3.21. Jesus says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And so it's this idea of, man, now we're supposed to fight the fight of faith. We're called to conquer. And so um, uh, if you've been at my church for any length of time, uh, you're going to know this, that um, actually uh, there's, there's, there's nine Rocky films. Do you believe that? Nine of them. But I want to tell you this, the canon of Rocky films are Rocky 1, Rocky 2, and Rocky 3. The other ones, man, they're just apocryphal, uh, man. They're just not in the canon of, of Rocky movies, all right? And so uh, if you remember Rocky 1, we're introduced to this guy, Rocky Balboa, and, and the hard life he's lived, man, it, it's it's, um, it created an endurance that marked his life, man. And, and so here's this underdog going to take on Apollo Creed, uh, the champion. And uh, remember, he drinks eggs and he's running out. He's, he's, he's um, punching and boxing a, a, a thing, a side of beef with these bloody knuckles. And, and we just loved every bit of it. And, and as we heard the, the theme song, dun, dun, da, 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 right, man? And it just all, oh, man, made us all wanted to go out and run and drink eggs and these kind of things. So so that was Rocky one. And then if you fast forward uh, several years later to Rocky three, we were introduced to Mr. T in that moment. And Mr. T, I remember like when he was interviewed, he says, do you hate Balboa? And he says, no, I don't hate Balboa. And he says, I pity the fool, right? <laughs> I pity the fool. And so, you know, he was actually quoting the Bible in that moment, right? And so, but, but back to our story, man, and it was Rocky three, where we got what? The eye of the tiger, right? That song, man, we used to get us all cranked up. But Rocky two was wedged in the middle of that one. And it was a much slower film. Like Rocky, Rocky two, it was just, just slow, man. Uh, Adrian, uh, 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 Adrian and Rocky uh, got married. She got pregnant. There's complications. And so there's no training, no boxing. That's just kind of this thing going on with Adrian and the baby. We weren't sure she was going to make it. And then they finally have the baby. And then we get to this moment uh, right here. And we're going to show it right now. Why don't you go get some sleep? Oh, no, no. I feel great. I feel great. Listen, I've been thinking. If you don't want me mixing with Creed no more, We'll make out some other kind of way, you know? There's one thing I want you to do for me. What? Come here. What? Win. Win. What are we waiting for? Take this! Man, when, when I see that, too, that, that part every time, win. Win. Do you know that that's what Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea? We, we've had a meal together. Now go out into the world and win. 
win. That's God's call when he calls us to be a conqueror. Do you know that word when we read the word conqueror? It's the word nikeo in the Greek. It's where we get the word Nike. It means victory. In fact, uh, we, we read Paul says in Romans 8 37, Paul says this, that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you and I are more than conquerors. Do you know that he made up a word in Greek? That, that word had never been used before. It's the word hypo nikeo, like far beyond victory. That's what he says, that you and I are in Christ because of the gospel. And so uh, I want to give you uh, the conquering mindset. Like, how, like, that's great, Pastor. How do we conquer? Well, Jesus is going to answer that question for us in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Je Jesus says this, and they have conquered him, him being the devil, by, gets this, and here's the three points, man, of living a, a conquering mindset. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love their lives, not uh, even unto death. And so here's what you get to see. Man, we see that it's the blood of the lamb. It's that the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives even to the point of dying. Um, and so, so let, let's look, look at this uh, mindset. Here's the first one is this, is the blood of the lamb. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on your behalf. Man, it is the first weapon and part of, of a conquering mindset that we have. Do you know that John 10.10 says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Like, like the devil, he wants to rob from you everything you hold dear and precious. He wants to steal the very thing that God has given to you. But here's the, yeah, that should let you know. Do you know the reason why he has to rob and steal? It's because you already possess it. It's what you possess already in the gospel is victory in God. It's already yours and it's already mine. Um, so there's a, a famous painting that's actually hung in, in Paris. It's called Checkmate. And it uh, uh, should be coming up on the screen. And in it, you can see, man, that there's this demonic looking character playing chess against this, this poor guy who just looks overwhelmed and, and beaten and defeated. And it's called Checkmate. And, and you know what? That there's a, a great chess master. He saw this painting. And as he was observing it, he noticed that, that the, the guy had another move on the chessboard. And the chess master said, you know what? I can win with that board. And isn't that true for you and I? That every time the devil would try to checkmate you, I got news for you. You got another word, uh, another move. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's by the blood of the lamb that we overcome and we conquer. Um, and so, uh, and then the, the second part of a conquering mindset is, is that we overcome by the very word uh, of our testimony. And so, um, do you know, in, in the book of Joshua, it's all about uh, walking into God's land of promise. And the only way you do it is by faith. And so in Joshua 3, 4, it says something interesting. Let me read it to you. It says, um, uh, it says this, yet there shall be a distance between you and it, it being the ark of the covenant. And it says uh, it should be about 2,000 cubits in length. Uh, that's about half a mile. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. Here it is. For you have not passed this way before. And so this, 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 I always wondered, like, what was meant by this thing? And so, man, you're going to possess your promised land by faith. You're going to believe God. And, and God told Joshua, man, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God has to go ahead of you more than a half a mile. And, and as it goes ahead of you, he's going to show you the way to go because you've not gone this way before. And, and listen, if you're going to win in your fight of faith, the only way you have a testimony is going through the test. And sometimes, man, it takes perspective. Uh, you have to have the, the Ark of the Covenant way out in front of you uh, in order to have faith. So uh, I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. So do you know, for, uh, for me in my, my playing days, that uh, uh, I was forced to retire. I had three back surgeries in one year, uh, and I also got a staph infection on top of that. And so uh, I, I want to tell you something. Um, I was furious at God, furious at God. There was another teammate of mine that, that like, he was like sleeping around with other women on his wife on the road and uh, got arrested and all these things. And I'm like, and he got an extension on his contract. And so I'm like, let me get this straight, Lord. I'm doing Bible studies, living for your glory on this team. And, and the, the, the adulterer guy, man, he gets another contract and I have to retire. Man, I was furious at the Lord. And here, listen, 
Well, and God was so gracious to me. Like, I don't know if you've ever asked this question, God, why me? God, why me? God, why me? But, but you know what I never did? I never asked the question, hey, um, I got to be drafted in the NHL. God, why me? Um, do you know I got to play for 14 years? God, why me? Right? Uh, you know that there's teammates of mine uh, that have passed away uh, and died, but I didn't. And I never at once asked, God, why me? Why do I get to live, right? And so with perspective, man, it, it allows us uh, to see the goodness of God in every situation. And so there's, a, there's something called stained glass theology. Do you know when you look at stained glass and if you get too close to it, it just looks like a bunch of colored jar, uh, shard pieces of glass. But what? With perspective, as you let it get out, you're able to see how all the pieces fit together. And sometimes in our walk of faith, when we're going through our test, uh, what we need, we need perspective to see the goodness of God. And so here would be my challenge to you if you're in a test right now. Don't let your circumstances frame God. Man, let God frame your circumstances. And here's what we know about God, that God is good. And let the goodness of God frame the circumstances of your life. And so we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. And last but not least, the conquering mindset is this. Don't love your life even to the point of death. We don't, we don't love our life. We love the Lord and people. Uh, and with that, that gives you a conquering uh, mindset. And so um, I think I'll close this way. So um, uh, everyone knows that at Every Nation New Jersey, we're dog people, not cat people. We tolerate uh, cat people uh, uh, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? But uh, in my home, like, I have uh, daughters and a wife, so there's a lot of estrogen. I had to get a little bit of testosterone, and so I got my dog, Dakota. And Dakota was my guy, man. And let me tell you this, uh, Dakota, I think we have an image of him. He was my friend, like we were buddies. Um, uh, here's another one. He was actually, he was a part uh, of our family. That man with every Christmas and family event, man, man, Dakota was right in the mix. And get this man, Dakota as well, he was funny. We could always dress him up in, in certain things and he, he was always game for it, right? And, and so this is who, who Dakota is. And get this, um, Dakota, later in life, he got really sick, really fast. And um, we had to, uh, uh, I think we have an image, and this was his last day with us. Uh, the vet said we had to put him down, that he was suffering. Um, and so get this, when I went to the vet, um, he was actually uh, in on, on a, uh, the vet's uh, clinic table, and he had all these wires and stuff, tubes going into him. When I entered into the room, Dakota, he stood up, all the tubes and stuff came out of him, and he let out this, whoo. And as he howled, man, I just, I just dropped to my feet. Man, just, just crying my face off, man. But, but I say that to say this. It's, it's like Dakota, uh, just before his death, that he saw me and somehow, some way, strength came into him. And, and I want to promise you this. I, I think this is what happens uh, at, the, at the end of our time. So there's, there's a man in the scripture that didn't love his life, even to the point of dying. He's the church's first martyr. His name is Stephen. You can read about him in Acts chapter 7. And as he's preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, people are furious and they take up rocks and they stone him to death. And the Bible says that as life is draining out of his body, he sees the heavens open up. And he says this, I, I see the Lord uh, uh, standing at the right hand of the Father, right? And so in this moment, it's, it's like, just like what happened with Dakota, man, li uh, life is draining out of his body and suddenly what strength comes as he sees the Lord and it's standing at the right hand of God the Father. And here's the reason why Jesus is standing, because Jesus promised what? Uh, and they have conquered him, or uh, here's what he, he promises them this. Uh, he says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. That as you don't love your life, even to the point of death, what happens? Jesus, he stands to his feet and he says, I have a place, place for you, seated with me on my throne. It's how we live zealously. Man, zeal is, is um, passion and action for God. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this time that, that we could spend together, Lord, around your word. And Lord, I, I pray, Lord, above all, God, that you would put a fire in the belly of your people, Lord. 
God, that, that we would, we would uh, Lord, hate lukewarmness as much as you do. And God, I pray that you would put a passion and a fire and a zeal for you uh, inside of our hearts. Lord, that, that as we have a, a meal with you each and every day and win our mornings, God, that we can go out and actually be uh, the glory of God in the earth. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen, every nation. Well, listen, uh, the sermon's over with. We're not quite finished. Uh, I want to remind you that you can be faithful in your tithing and your giving. Uh, I just want to say thank you, those of you that are partnering with us in order to get the gospel out. And, and so there's three ways that you can give. Uh, you can go to our website, encnj.org, and just hit the giving icon. Uh, or you can give via text. This is the way my family and I give. If you text the letters ENCNJ to the number 77977, it's a very convenient and fast way to give. Uh, or you can mail in your check or money order right here to our church offices at 101 Gibraltar Drive right here in Morris Plains, New Jersey. And may God richly provide for you uh, as you are faithful in your tithing and your giving. And one last thing before we go to, if, if, if this message has been a blessing to you, uh, would you, would you rate it or share it and get it out, uh, spread the word to other people, uh, it, it would be great and it helps us to advance the gospel. Every nation, Jesus loves you and I think you're pretty amazing too. Have a great week.